Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me, as usual, back at home in his bunker is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. It's cold in this bunker. Is it colder there? It's a little chilly, yeah. Oh, it's because you're in your basement bunker. Yeah, I'm in my basement, in my PJs, and a t-shirt, so. Oh, and your gym yeah, jams. Cold. And you're wearing that poutine shirt that I've seen you in every single day yeah. that we've logged in together and talked. You have that exact same shirt on. It must actually be able to just peel off your body now. <laughs> well, it was washed on Wednesday. Mm. And then I wore it Thursday and Friday because I love it. Yeah, it's a nice shirt. And most of my shirts with my added 25 pounds, most of my shirts no longer are fitting. And so this is one that still fits. Oh, you should go into my closet. There's a plethora of different sizes. <laughs> I just, I'm going to have to start working out again or running or some crap. Well, now that I've hurt my foot, I have uh, a tendonitis on the top of my foot. I can't go for my walks. Oh my God. Yeah, I hurt myself walking. Just even when you're trying to do the right thing. Right. God damn it. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double, and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Chop, chop, chop. Back to the chomping. Yeah, I felt it was chomp time. Some of our topics are difficult for people. Uh, some of them are not. This one I don't think will be too difficult for people. So, well, well, good. Listeners who feel they're in crisis, though, can contact the Crisis Text Line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868. And in the US or UK, text HOME to 741741. You'll be matched with a volunteer counselor who is supervised by a licensed, trained mental health professional. Crisis Text Line is free 24-7 support for those in crisis. For more information, please go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org globally. And let's get on with this show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In this offering of Dark Poutine, we're on our way back in time to the prairie province of Manitoba, your your dad's home province. Yeah, yeah, hometown for pops. This week, we're going to learn that not every criminal is a loathsome troll who should be locked away forever. Oh, oh, do tell, do tell. We're going to meet Ken Leishman. Ken's story reads like the script of a Hollywood movie, but it isn't. We've done that before, but this is no Die Hard. This is a real story. He was a good-looking guy with a Clark Gable mustache and always a snappy dresser. I dig him already. Ken was adventurous, smart, charismatic, creative, and enterprising. He charmed everyone he knew with his smile, giggle, and wry sense of humor. Ken Leishman was married to the love of his life, Elva, and father of seven children. Ken and Elva, what a pair. <laughs> Ken had big dreams and high hopes. 
He liked to live large, often beyond his means, which ran he and his family deeply into debt. Uh-oh. As with many criminals, Ken started out as a petty thief. He later graduated to bank robbery. As he was a pilot, he wasn't above stealing a plane. Wait, so he was a pilot and he was struggling for loot? How much money was this guy spending? Let's just find out. Let's talk about Ken a little bit. Yeah. Ken was also the mastermind behind the largest gold heist in Canadian history up to that point. And after that, he planned and executed the largest prison break in Manitoba's history. What the hell? In his later life, the press was enamored with him and he made for a great interview. He was, in the minds of some, presumably in his own as well, Canada's answer to Errol Flynn. (laughs) He went out the only way Ken Leishman could, leaving a bit of a mystery behind. Mm. This is episode 123, the story of Ken Leishman, the Flying Bandit. What a prolific criminal. Uh, So sources for this episode will include a few books, Bandit, A Portrait of Ken Leishman by Wayne Tefts, William Kenneth Leishman, Lost, uh, oh, Lost, Unsolved Mysteries of Canadian Aviation by Shirley Smith Matheson, Tales from the Underworld by Ronald, Roland Penner and Norm Larson, and finally, In the Mind of a Mountie by T.M. Scotty Gardner. I was just going to say, this totally reminds me of something that would have been on Unsolved Mysteries. Actually, it didn't pop up ever in my research, so I don't think it was. Also invaluable in my research were the documentary by Monarch Films called Ken Leishman, The Flying Bandit, the blog, This Was Manitoba, a two-part series on the case written by crime writer Max Haynes in 1983, and The Usual Suspects, Newspapers.com, and other news organizations. Hmm. So there's been a lot written about this guy, but it's strange that not a lot of people know about him. As of now, uh, I'm not recalling anything about him. What date range was he doing criminal activities? We're going to get into that. Norman Allen Leishman of Treyhern, Manitoba, and Irene Beatrice Agarand of Holland, Manitoba, were married in Winnipeg on September 25th, 1928. Mm. Their son, William Kenneth Leishman, was born on the family farm during the height of the Great Depression on July 20th, 1931, near Holland, Manitoba. The couple had two other children as well, Elizabeth and Robert. From the blog, this was Manitoba. Quote, Holland was a pretty typical Manitoba farming community. At the time, it would have had at least three or four grain elevators that were serviced by the two railway tracks that passed through the town. It also had a bustling main street thanks to the 400 or so area residents. This, of course, changed as the Depression wore on. The effects of drought and bottomed-out commodity prices would have rippled from farmers to farm workers to townspeople, end quote. Hmm. The story starts in the Great Depression. Which is how things should. Like, if you've got to start your life, that's a great period to start it. Well, it kind of doesn't get much better for young Ken Leishman. Financial strife has other effects on the family, and that was so for the Leishmans. Ken's mom and dad separated when he was only seven years old. Oh, okay. Being a single mother in the 1930s was just as tough as it is today, if not tougher with the stigmas around separation and divorce at the time. Well, yeah, and uh, women in the workplace, all kinds of, yeah, and a Great Depression. Yep. Many people look down their noses at couples who split as failures, and their children were often the point of jokes and bullying at school. Mm -hmm. Because, you know. Kids are jerks. Yeah, I know I was. Yeah. Ken's mother became uh, the live-in housekeeper for a widower nearby. The man did not like Ken and physically abused him on a number of occasions. Damn. Remembering the events, Irene was quoted by the Winnipeg Free Press's Gordon Sinclair in 1966. She said, quote, He used to beat Kenny with a stick of stove wood. He pounced on him for everything, end quote. I like that they have a separate wood for the stove. Just this is stove wood. Well, yeah. And, and, and there is fireplace wood. It's just wood, man. Just use it all. Sure. According to the blog, This Was Winnipeg, foster care was also not a safe place for Ken. 
Uh, He had a hard time in a few foster homes prior to being pushed into a, quote, residential orphanage after Children's Aid seized him from an abusive household. Mm. Imagine, both of your parents are still alive, your mother is working somewhere, and you're unwanted there, your father has gone off to fight in World War II, and you've been abused in more than one place, you're stuck in it now, then you have to go into an orphanage. Complete feeling of uh, being abandoned. Yeah. You're only seven. You get the crap kicked out of you and your mom picks the job over you. Yeah. You can't live with dad because he's gone away. Like, it's awful. It would be difficult to feel more unwanted. Yeah. Irene and Norman divorced when Ken was 12 years old so Irene could remarry him. Mm -hmm. Ken was finally able to move away from the orphanage and back in with his mother, but that was short-lived. Ken and William Brooking, Irene's new husband, did not see eye to eye. Hmm. In fact, they hated each other. Well, that's outstanding. Yeah. Again, rather than chance some more instability for her other children, Irene chose to send Ken away again. Oh my God, I can't imagine. Right? I relate to this story from my perspective as an adopted person, but I can't imagine my birth mom having to make that decision to send me away over and over and over again. From what she's told me, that single decision that she had to make was really difficult, as I'm sure it was. I can't imagine having to make that decision multiple times and the effect that it had not only on the mother, but on the child as well. Yeah, you've got to make a hard decision. Uh, One time I would be uh, still thinking that's pretty shitty. Uh, Two times, though. Yeah. Ken dropped out of school in the seventh grade and was shuffled off once again, this time to live and work with his grandparents on their farm. From the blog, this was Manitoba, quote, The farm brought stability to Ken's life, although he was prone to accidents. One incident involved being kicked in the head by a horse, something Irene claimed in the 60s that may have accounted for some of his bad behavior. That's pretty fucking rough. Kicked in the head. Yeah, he's lucky he's not dead. Yeah, right? Like, seriously. Norman Leishman, Ken's dad, had remarried too, and he'd begun working for Western Elevator and Motor Company after the war. When Ken was 16, he went to live with his dad and his new wife in Winnipeg. Ken got himself a gig at a resort in Kenora, Ontario that summer, but had to give it up and return to Winnipeg after he broke his ankle while working there only a short time. Yeah, this guy's accident prone, all right. Well, according to an article in the Winnipeg Press by Christian Cassidy, quote, later that year, a chance to work on a ship in the Great Lakes also ended abruptly when his appendix burst. Holy Christ. Yeah. This he's had, a, he's had a bad run of luck, this fella. He certainly did. Well, it gets a little better here. Oh, that's great. It was soon after that that he met Elva Shields. The pair fell in love, quickly becoming inseparable. They married when Ken was 18 and Elva was 17. Ken was working part-time with his dad at the elevator repair company by this time. Sweet. And they moved into a little apartment, setting up their life. Yeah. Little honeymoon going on. This job gave Ken access to a number of local businesses. Hmm. Wanting to provide for Elva, Ken had numerous items shipped to their apartment to furnish their little home. Okay. The problem was Ken had not paid for them. Well, (laughs) yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. From the blog, this was Manitoba. Quote, in February 1950, his thefts included a radio from a downtown building, a fridge and a range from the Westinghouse building, a Chesterfield suite, dinette suite and chairs from Genzer's Warehouse on Market Street, a bed and kitchen suite from the Genzer's Warehouse on Ross Avenue. The total value of the goods was just under $1,000. And this is 1950. It's That's a lot of money. So he was just, because he had access to these shops, he was just going in and taking items? Well, so what he would do, he would go in late at night yeah, and pose as somebody who worked at the store. Okay. And call up a delivery company. Oh, my God. And have them come pick up the stuff and deliver it to his house. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow, so brazen. 
he was busted when he went back to Genzer's for another late night foray, mm. which was kind of his undoing. According to the documentary, Ken Leishman, the flying bandit, when Ken perceived himself getting away with something in one place, it was not beyond him to return to the scene of the crime for more. So he just would go back. Yeah, that's really not recommended. No. Criminal activity is not recommended, period. Not highly, no. But, you know, don't go back multiple times to the same location. Ken missed part of his honeymoon because he was arrested (laughs) and thrown into the slammer. He pled guilty to these crimes and was sentenced to nine months in jail. Which, I mean, that always goes over well when you have to skip your honeymoon because of jail time. Always goes over, yeah. Yeah. Uh, He spent almost four months in jail before he was released early due to good behavior. Even the police and jailers seemed to like him. He was just a nice guy. Oh, that's great. But it was here that Ken began to forge relationships with con men and other 'er ne'er-do-wells that would influence his actions over the ensuing years. Yep, that expression, uh, prison just helps you become a better criminal. Yeah. Elva, of course, did not like some of the unsavory characters that Ken began to pal around with from that point on. She was busier with other matters, though, as she was pregnant and dealing with children other than Ken. (laughs) As their family grew, eventually ballooning to seven kids. Holy shit. Right. Seven kids. Like, when does it end? This guy's out causing trouble, and I'm I'm just having child after child after child (laughs) help. I I have two, but at least I know that, you know, at 18, roughly, I'm free. Yeah. If you have seven kids, it's just this perpetual, like, you, you oh, this is the last one. You know, I, I, I can, I know there'll be a time where I have some freedom. Oh, I'm pregnant again. Like, it's just this constant resetting. On, oh. Ken loved airplanes, and after getting out of the clink, he set his sights on the wild blue yonder. While working at a handful of mechanical and sales-related positions, he started taking flying lessons. It's good to have dreams. Ken learned to deftly pilot an aircraft over the next few years and somehow came up with enough cash to purchase his own small airplane in 1952 for $1,000. Same amount of furniture he stole. Yeah. (laughs) From This Was Manitoba, quote, In October 1953, he received a two-year suspended sentence for flying without a pilot's license. It's unclear whether he obtained one after that or if he just kept flying, end quote. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I couldn't find anywhere that he had ever actually obtained an honest pilot's license. Well, I wonder, like, even now, like, how often are you required to show your pilot's license? Probably every time you want to fly a plane somewhere. I, uh... Register with the uh, airport. I would hazard to guess that if you want to fly an airplane, you have to register somewhere. Okay, but maybe not in the 50s. Maybe not. I, I'm imagining that, yeah, the oversight wasn't as grand as it is now. Correct. Well, this was all a small setback for Ken, this two year suspended sentence. Ken used his newly acquired skill as a pilot to become a fly in farm equipment mechanic landing in fields where there were no airstrips for miles so he could fix tractors and combines for hard-working prairie farmers. Sounds dangerous and fun. Yeah, what a good idea. Yeah. Just have this guy come fly and land in my fallow field, and it's kind of awesome. Yeah, it'd be, certainly be pretty risky and dangerous uh, flying into a field with no airstrip, but I guess that's just uh, part of the excitement of the adventure. Ken had a growing family to feed, as we've mentioned, After moving around a lot at first, they finally bought a house in Winnipeg. (coughs) Ken had to pay for that, plus a plane to maintain, and an increasingly expensive lifestyle, which included a Cadillac and a wardrobe full of stylish clothes. I was living that uh, George Clooney life back then. He began working as a flying salesman, taking cookware and cutlery to sell to remote farmers' wives, and began working toward his dream of owning a fly-in hunting and fishing resort. It's a swell dream. Yeah. He upgraded planes from his old ride to a brand new Stinson. Oh. oh. Ken was active in the community as well, becoming part of the Manitoba Volunteer Air Patrol, according to a Windsor Star article on March 18th, 1957. Hmm. He was, pun intended, flying high. Ew. Ew. <laughs> a really big shoe. 
Things fell apart that year. Oh, well. Hmm. Ken's cookware business was floundering, and he was not making nearly enough cash to keep himself living in his accustomed style, let alone save for his dreamed lodge. Uh, I, I'm no, like, uh, aeronautics expert, but I think air travel to own your own uh, plane and to fly it about, um, I imagine that's pretty expensive. One would need to be selling a bucket load of of uh, cutlery and uh, appliances or whatever the hell he was selling. Yeah, it was all cookware and crap. All cookware. You, one would have to sell a, a bucket load of cookware to keep up the expenses of jet setting about landing in various fields. Exactly. Well, he had an idea to make some quick cash. Hmm. On December 16th, 1957, Ken took a commercial flight from Winnipeg to Toronto, rented a car and drove into the city, putting himself up in a luxury apartment style hotel. I like where that's going. That sounds nice. It sounds very nice. From a Windsor Star article on December 18, 1957, released by Canadian Press, quote, One gentlemanly gunman went about a $10,000 bank robbery as though applying for a loan. Natalie dressed, he entered the downtown Albert and Young Street branch of the Toronto Dominion Bank, represented himself as Mr. Gare of Buffalo, and asked to see the manager on business. The manager, A.J. Lunn, invited him into his office, told him to take off his coat. He did. He then pulled a gun from his briefcase and said calmly, You realize this is a holdup? <laughs> he forced the manager to write a counter check for $10,000 and accompany him to a teller. At the wicket, he asked for large bills, stuffing them in his briefcase. Come on, I'll buy you a cup of coffee, he said to Mr. Lunn. <laughs> Oh my God. And they walked past a traffic policeman outside the bank, continuing for a block along crowded Young Street. Merry Christmas, said the gunman, and stepped into the crowds, end quote. Oh, holy shit, that's fantastic. Hey, when you're labeled the gentlemanly gunman. Yeah. Like, wow, you've made a good impression for, for a gunman. Because normally it's the disheveled maniac gunman approached us, not uh, the gentlemanly gunman. Merry Christmas indeed, though. Uh, Ken had gotten away with ten grand, which adjusted for inflation is over $90,000 today. Oh, shit. As returning to the scene of the crime was his habit, Ken decided he'd fly back to Toronto one morning in March of 1958, employing pretty much the same M.O. This time he hit the Bank of Commerce at Young and Bloor from a CP article in the Edmonton Journal on March 19, 1958. Bank manager Howard F. Mason said, quote, He was well-dressed and spoke and acted like a successful businessman. He was carrying a briefcase. He introduced himself as Mr. McGill and said he had a contracting firm in Welland, Ontario and wanted to open an account at the bank. Mr. McGill, I guess that isn't his real name, opened the briefcase and produced a letter folder and said there were some reports there that I would want to see. The man said, you'll find this rather an unusual type of business. <laughs> he drew a Luger pistol from the folder and pointed it at the manager. The man asked the manager where his gun and alarm were. Mason told him and commented, don't be ridiculous, we're not going to have this sort of thing around here. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Mason was upset. Clearly. I stood up and made for the office space next door. Mason said later, he grabbed me by the coat and tore off a button. Shit, not a button. Then he panicked and ran out. I hollered to the boys next door to ring the alarm. Two of them took off after him down the street. I whistled to Bill Wilson, the constable outside on the corner, to go after him. End quote. Wow, Mr. Mason, courage. Right? So wow. here's Ken Leishman running down the street, having just torn a button off the uh, the bank manager's jacket yeah. after a failed robbery this time. Yeah. Ken's flight from the two accountants and the police officer ended when he was tripped by a woman on the street who'd seen him fleeing. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, shit. A fast-thinking Baptist reverend kicked the gun out of Ken's hand as the two accountants and police officer tackled Ken Leishman, who gave up after a brief struggle. What a spectacular visual that has provided me. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Ken was charged with this robbery and the one the previous year, and the press dubbed him the Flying Bandit when they discovered that he was a pilot and he had flown from Manitoba. It has a nice ring to it, I'm not gonna lie. Ken was convicted and sentenced to 12 years in prison. <laughs> Ken Leishman's boldest crimes were yet to come, though. We'll get into those and the rest of the Flying Bandit's life after this quick break. And we're back. So what do you think of this guy, Scott? <laughs> he's so silly. This guy's funny. Well, you know, he's probably scaring the crap out of people, though, pulling guns on them. and He'd never hurt anybody, but, you know. Well, not physically. Yeah. But it, it it's just such, like, I'm envisioning a 1950s Keystone Cops kind of a, 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 a movie happening here. Are you struggling with the uh, bank manager and then running out past the cop and an old lady trips him and then a preacher or a priest kicks his gun. <laughs> like, it's, this guy got, it gets... It's ridiculous. Uh, it's ridiculous. It sure is. Yeah, well... It all really happened, though. That's the thing. That's what that. Yeah, that even makes that makes it even more ridiculous. Yeah, the old truth is stranger than fiction. Ken was again a model prisoner, and again well liked by jailers and his fellow prisoners. He was released from prison after serving only three and a half of his twelve-year sentence. Wow, that's quite the reduction. One of Ken's release conditions was that he was to remain in Manitoba, which he appeared to do for. At least a few years. But Ken had been working on some other things. He'd met a lawyer named Harry Backlin in Stony Mountain Prison and struck up a friendship with a few of the cons inside. Well, there you go. Ken had become obsessed with gold. He knew through a friend that gold bullion mined locally in Red Lake, Ontario was being flown into Winnipeg and then minted there. Ken watched for the holes in security that he found surprisingly lax and cooked up his plan involving three prison buddies and a lawyer, Harry Backlund. Harry Backlund. From Tales of the Underworld, quote, One of the five Confederates was stationed in Red Lake as a lookout for a substantial gold shipment leaving for Winnipeg by air. The other two were outfitted with fake Air Canada white overalls that Leishman had prepared by stenciling on the Air Canada Maple Leaf logo. And Air Canada bills of lading that he had easily purloined from the Air Canada office when it was deserted at coffee break. Uh, hold on one second here. Did you just say purloined? Yes. Yeah, I have no idea what that is. Just, he stole them. Mm -mm. I, I love the sound of it. He purloined them. On March 1st, 1966, the call came from Red Lake. A very large quantity of, quote, moose meat, the conspirator's code word for the gold, was on its way. <laughs> that evening, the two members of the team whose job it was to take the gold drove up to the North Landing area in an Air Canada van that Leishman had noted earlier was always left in a nearby open garage with the keys in the ignition. Presented with a seemingly genuine bill of lading by two men dressed in what appeared to be official Air Canada uniforms, the air crew obligingly offloaded 12 54-pound boxes of pure gold bars into the Air Canada van. End quote. Holy shit. Wow. That seemed way too easy. The bandits thanked the airline workers <laughs> for their help and sped off in the stolen van to where Leishman's car waited. There, they loaded the 12 boxes of gold into the trunk, ditched the van and the uniforms, then drove to Harry Backlund's to stash the loot. Leishman knew Backlund and his wife were vacationing in L.A., so he stashed 11 of the 12 boxes in the Backlund's deep freeze for safekeeping. <laughs> Taking the 12th box... For himself and hiding it. 
the bandits had made off with $383,497 worth of gold, almost 1,100 ounces worth. The conversion comes out to a worth of around $18.6 million today. Holy shit. You're set. How can he fuck up from this point? You're set. We'll get to that. Oh, my God. The news exploded the next morning with word of the massive heist, and the cops were knocking on Leishman's door soon afterward. He was... Known. Just somebody they would suspect for this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He played dumb, and the airport employees couldn't ID him from the photo lineup. When the cops left his house... Ken called Backlin in Los Angeles to let him know that the moose meat had been delivered. <laughs> That's the best name for stolen goods ever. It's very Canadian. He yeah, had the moose meat. Backlin was pissed when he learned that the gold was in his wife's deep freeze, and he wanted it gone before he and she got back three days later. Get that darn gold out of there. <laughs> Ken agreed to remove it, but that's not exactly what happened. Mother Nature had other things in mind. Oh, no. There was a blizzard, and Ken couldn't get to the house. <laughs> He'd only had the single box that he had hidden. Oh, God. As Backlund and his wife came off the plane from Vancouver, who should be standing there waiting for him but good old Ken Leishman? Ken apologized to let Harry know the moose meat was still in their house as he drove them home. The blizzards kept coming, preventing them from moving the gold. When his wife wasn't looking, Backlund buried the 11 boxes remaining in snowdrifts in the backyard. Mm. He was terrified his wife would find him in the deep freeze. Like, you know, she's going down there for some, uh, for some <laughs> hamburger or something. And uh, wh why are there 11 boxes of pure gold in here? <laughs> what? I, why, where, how did that happen? Ken wanted the money fast. He needed to meet his contact in Hong Kong with a sample of the gold, six pounds, to prove its quality and that they had a lot of it. This guy in Hong Kong was going to sell it for them. Sweet. At the time, okay, at the time, Ken would need to show that he'd had a smallpox vaccination to regain entry back into Canada after traveling to certain countries abroad. All right. So Ken and Harry Backlund went to see a doctor together. The doctor who gave Ken his vaccination, knowing Leishman was not supposed to leave the country, smelled a rat and told the police what he was up to. Oh, shit. Ken somehow ditched surveillance and was on a plane and in Vancouver before cops figured out where he was. In the meantime, they'd been watching Harry Backlund and caught him with one of the boxes of gold at his office. Mm. So now they know who done it. Mm. Ten more bricks were found in Backlund's backyard in the snowdrifts that he'd left them in. Oh, shit. Leishman went to check in for his Hong Kong flight and was accidentally tipped off by a Canadian Pacific Airlines employee who didn't fully read the notice next to Ken's name that he was to report to the RCMP office in the airport. Ken was seen soon after outside the airport near a drainage ditch where it is presumed he stashed some of the gold as when he was later arrested, sitting on the plane waiting to depart, he didn't have it with him. Oh, shit. Ken did not give up its location, and an amount of gold from the heist remains missing to this day. No. Yeah, and in the documentary they said, uh, okay, people with metal detectors just in Vancouver because you should be looking for this gold around the airport. Oh my God. I can't see that going over well, though. Oh, no, not at all. On March 10th, 1966, Ken was returned to Winnipeg to serve the remaining 2,288 days left on his parole from the two bank robberies. Okay. He was held without bail, pending another trial on the gold theft. With nothing but time on his hands, Ken hatched another plan with a few other prisoners to overpower the guards and escape the jail in Steinbach, Manitoba. <laughs> this is just nonstop. In September of 1966, Ken's plan went into action and three others managed to get the keys from the jailers stole one of their cars in the parking lot and raced to a nearby airport where they stole a small airplane. <laughs> a brand new Mooney Mark 12. Holy shit. With the experienced pilot Leishman at the helm, they flew south across the border into the U.S., 
making it as far as Gary, Indiana, where they landed in a farmer's field. A tavern owner called the cops when Ken tried to pay for a round of drinks with Canadian money. <laughs> After a brief chase, the group was surrounded. A shootout ensued, but no one was badly hurt. One guy got, like, shot through the wrist or something. Phew. They were taken into custody and sent back to Winnipeg. I'm exhausted, and I wasn't even there for any of this. Well, it's not over yet. <laughs> From Max Haynes, quote, Back in Winnipeg, Ken could hardly figure out that all the charges against him. <laughs> the various sentences would add up to a lifetime behind bars. Uh, he had only one thought in his mind, freedom. Yeah, escape. Yeah. Pleading ill health, he was allowed out of his cell to exercise. Using a bit of wire, he managed to open an outside door and overpower a guard. Utilizing torn strips of bed clothing, he shimmied over a 12-foot fence, badly cutting his hand on barbed wire in the process. That same bitter cold night, Ken was apprehended in a phone booth by Constable Ed Finney of the West Kildonian Police Force. <laughs> on November 1st, 1966, Ken received a relatively light sentence of seven years imprisonment for all his escapades incurred after the gold robbery. His luck held... The gold heist netted an eight-year sentence to run concurrently with the seven years. End quote. That, that's not as much as I was expecting. Nope. Wow. Ken was active in prison. He got himself his grade 12. He took up writing poetry. Aww. Again, everyone seemed to love the guy on both sides of the prison fence. Elva stuck with him even though she couldn't take much more of his shenanigans. Wow, that's really uh, tolerant of her. Yeah. After Ken's release from prison in 1974, Leishman moved his family to Red Lake, Ontario, the place where he'd <laughs> stolen the gold from in 1977. There he managed the small Tomahawk Airlines and a clothing store. He was active in the local Chamber of Commerce, and some reports say he was the deputy mayor of Red Lake at one point, but I was unable to verify that. I, I hope it's true, just because it makes the story even crazier. From the blog, this was Manitoba, quote, Ken continued to fly, and on December 14, 1979, Leishman was performing a medevac flight out of Red Lake when his plane disappeared in northern Ontario. The following spring, a Canadian Forces search flight found the wreckage. The bodies of the patient and medical assistant aboard were positively identified, but all they could find of Leishman was his wallet and some scraps of clothing. Given his colorful past, there was speculation that the flying bandit had escaped again. An inquest, however, at, at the inquest, however, experts concluded that his body was likely taken and eat, uh, taken away and eaten by wolves. Because, mm. I mean, at this point, he's, he's done his time and he's, for all intents and purposes, doing... Yeah, he'd, what would he have to try to run from at this point? Yeah, good question. I don't know. On December 16th, 1980, Leishman was declared legally dead at the age of 48. He left behind his wife of 30 years, seven children, and quite a legend. End quote. Hmm. Right up until he disappeared, Ken was always willing to sit for an interview about the, old, about the old days. He seemed to relish being called the Flying Bandit. He was even being romanced by Hollywood producers who wanted to make a movie of his life at the time. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah. I still think they should. Yeah, it's, it's quite the story for sure. You just get George Clooney in there. Right? <laughs> Somebody like that. And that, friends, is the story of Ken Leishman, the Flying Bandit. Hell, that was entertaining. Wasn't it? Yeah. I thought it was pretty good. Wow, that was a lot of gold they got. Maybe they should have planned better what happens after. That's usually where things kind of fall apart. Yeah, I, you know, which is a clear indication that a lot of criminals don't think they're actually going to get away with their plan. Yeah. Well, it's like Goodfellas, right? Remember Robert De Niro's like bumping everybody off? and Yeah. It's time for voicemails. <laughs> you can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. That's one eight seven seven dark putin if your call stands out, you might hear it on the show. And uh, here's our first one. And this one comes to us from, uh, looks like, Tirana. 
which uh, oh. figures quite nicely in this episode. So here we go. Mm-hmm. Hi, Mike and Scott. It's Christina calling from Toronto, Ontario. I heard my Patreon shout out last night on the show while I was at work, and you guys totally made my life. Uh, I want to let you guys know how much the podcast means to me. I love listening to you guys. I work overnight at a grocery store, and you keep me happy and entertained and laughing all night long. I love Scott's stories about where people are from. Uh, So thanks so much for the laughter. Thank you for making life a little bit better. And um, go shit in your toques, boys. There you go. So thank you so much. That is, uh, that's kind of awesome. Thanks, Christina. I'm currently shitting in my toque. Yeah, I, I'm watching him over Zoom do it. It's yeah. not, it's not pleasant because he's kind of got the hat up on his desk and, uh, let's just say, uh, I have thoughts of toothpaste and I'm not entirely sure why. <laughs> I, I should have planned this better. You would, th- you would think logistically it's easy to do, but in, in practical, hmm. No. Took pooping is not exactly uh, the most uh, clean thing to do. No, no, in any capacity. Cause, and then you know, as at this exact moment, I'm struggling with, do I wipe with the toque? Right. Yeah, you don't do that. Or do I use teepee and put that in said toque as well? I need teepee for my poo hole. <laughs> exactly, cornholio. Okay, here's one from somebody who looks like they might be a driver. And I think we've heard from them before, so. Hi, Mike and Scott. It's Alicia Retta calling again. I left you guys a message a while back. I guess it wasn't that compelling or funny enough to be on. I'm not offended by it, but you can still go shit in your head. But no, I just wanted to say thank you again for always making my long road trip Amazing. I am doing a 29-hour drive from York and Saskatchewan to Kingston, Ontario, um, both places where many criminals come from. Um, my One thing I wanted to say to Mike, um, I wanted to suggest possibly talking about my case, um, which is Mark Bedford case, and even talking to you further about my great uncle, Wayne Millette, who was murdered uh, many years ago that you guys also talked about. Um, Scott, one message for you. One thing I've noticed uh, is listening to your show, you like to say Jesus Christ a lot. And and, I, and while I appreciate that, and I, I appreciate you taking the Lord's name in vain, why not try a little something different like what I say, which is sweet sandals of Christ or holy swinging Moses. Anyways, guys, I'm on my way to North Bay. I'm ho- hopefully going to get to Kingston by tonight. And it's all because of you guys that you're keeping me awake and inspired to keep going. Thanks, guys. That's awesome. Sweet swinging sandals of Moses. I love that idea. <laughs> swinging sandals of Moses. <laughs> I used to. I used to say when I was a little kid, uh, because I wasn't allowed to swear, yeah. I would say cod, ham, cheese, and rice. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound delicious. No, cod, ham, cheese, and rice. I was I was able to swear from a pretty early age, so yeah, not me. I, I didn't have to get too creative. We had to call farts whippersnappers, so it was. Uh, <laughs> we were a very square family. Huh. What can you do? Let's listen to another voicemail. Mm-hmm. Hey, Mike and Scott, it's Amber from Wasaga Beach, Ontario. That's the least where I live now, and. I have a funny little coronavirus joke that I thought you guys might take a laugh at. That the reason why people are running out of toilet paper in the shops is because when one person coughs, six people poop themselves. Now, I'm not sure if it's in their pants or in their hat, but have a nice day, night, whatever, and munch, 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 your dark Putin. Love your guys' episodes. My favorite was the Humboldt Broncos one. Bye. Oh, oh! Thanks, thanks, Amber. That was great. Yeah, <laughs> that was funny. So, yeah, six people pooped their pants. Yeah, that, yeah. Kind, that kind of makes sense. You know, there's there's some good math in that. I think so. It's it it holds it holds up. I think she might be on the right track. Mm-hmm. The poop track. Oh no! There's always the poop track, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, tell me about it. Oh boy. All right, let's listen to another one. Oh, okay. Here's a here's one from Carrie. Hey guys, this is Carrie. 
Um, I just tried to leave a message and I stumbled over my words and got embarrassed and hung up the phone. So this is my second attempt at this, so ignore the other one. Um, as I said in the last message, I am a nurse. I live in Johnstown, Ontario, which is a small little uh, border town right on the St. Lawrence, right across from Ogdensburg, New York. Um, I work at the Brockville General Hospital and I've been listening to you guys for uh, just about a year when I discovered podcasts and yours was the first podcast that I'd ever listened to. Um, you guys are sort of my de-stress at the end of the day when I'm coming home from work and I listen to you on the way in as well and you've given me lots of smiles. Um, I've learned a lot from you guys and, and I've really grown to, um, to admire both of you um, and I find your voices quite comforting after a stressful day. Um, recently, we've had a tragedy in Brockville. Um, one of our nurses at BGH was murdered by her um, domestic spouse, I, I guess you would say, um, when they left two children behind. Um, she was also pregnant with her third child at the time. Um, so I, we we in Brockville are feeling um, you know, a lot of pain. And during the stressful time, we're also not given the opportunity to grieve appropriately because we can't have funerals um, or big gatherings at this time because the whole world has just gone to shit right now. Um, so I guess I, I'm, I'm just calling to leave this message to thank you for what you do and just to let you know that um, from the flip side of things, um, from, from the opposite team, I guess, uh, from the people uh, who you're helping by telling these stories, from the family, the friends, the loved ones, the colleagues, um, I can imagine that you bring them peace. Um, so again, thank you for what you do. Um, and you guys have a wonderful day. Stay safe and uh, wash your damn hands. Take care. Bye. Oh, no, no, honestly, like, thank you for what you do. We just exactly sit in front of a mic and, and uh, tell Well, a that's story. what you do. You just sit in front of a mic. <laughs> shh, no, shh. Compared to, compared, to, compared to what, what she's doing, what yeah. nurses are having to go through. Uh, and especially, yeah. And then suffering the tragedy she's speaking of losing somebody. Yeah. We talked about it in last week's episode and how people can't give each other hugs. So virtual yeah. hugs from Mike and Scott here to oh, you. Oh God, yeah. Uh, I could hear the emotion in her voice. That was a tough one. Yeah, yeah. It it, it means the world getting messages like that. To, uh, to know that it's just us doing this uh, can put a smile on somebody's face for a brief moment is pretty... It's pretty amazing. Again, you can leave us a voicemail at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six one eight seven seven D A R K P T N one eight seven seven Dark Putin. <laughs> Scott's looking at his texts. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah. So up next, oh yes, it's time for Patreon shoutouts. I guess we got to get caught up because we didn't do any last week. Yeah. Everybody kind of nobody gave me any grief for missing it. I kind of knew that nobody would because no. everybody really understood. Um, that, that was a hard, hard uh, episode. So I, I'm, yeah, I can, I'm not surprised that people understood. Yeah. For both of us, it was, it was pretty tough. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned even more stuff since uh, we talked about it a little on our most recent after show. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot here. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Yeah, it really is. Uh, we really appreciate that, uh, holy crow, that people, uh, oh boy, that <laughs> people, people <laughs> still appreciate us. So first up, we have a Christy Harris from Calgary, Alberta. Thank you, Christy. Thanks so much, Christy Harris. Uh, next up, we have another PM. We have a Whoa. new prime minister. Whoa. Celeste Lawson from Kirkland, Washington. Well, thank you, or, Celeste. As I like to say, Washington. Washington, yeah. Right across an, that border there. Yeah, because there's an H in it. Yeah, Warsh. No, yeah. there's an R. Warsh. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I, my, I had a, a childhood friend who uh, that his parents would always call it Washington. Exactly. <laughs> So thank you so much, Celeste. Next, we have somebody who doesn't really um, leave us uh, any much inform much information other than the name Hartwright, H-A-R-T, 
W R I T E, heart right. Heart right. That's it. That's it. Oh, are you familiar with heart right? No, I am not at all. Oh, well, it's a good thing I am. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Heart right. Heart right is from Nicaragua. Nicaragua. I'm oh. struggling with the pronunciation. Nicaragua. Uh, mm-hmm. And you, you know where specifically? No, I El, honestly don't. El Tuma. El Tuma, Nicaragua. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what does uh, this? What does heart right do in El Tuma, Nicaragua? Nothing. One of the uh, little known facts of El Tuma is they have a hundred percent unemployment. A hundred percent. Yep, hundred percent unemployment. There's no jobs. Well, how do they survive? That's a great question. They're resourceful. They forage. They uh, hunt, which I guess is part of foraging. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. They. Uh, it's it's not a great place. I'm just gonna be honest. It's not a great place. You don't want to go yeah. to El Tuma. Well, so, let's not I, go there then. Yeah, not not all of the stories are gonna end up positive. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but El Tuma is just not the place to be. Okay. Yeah. That's sad. It's, sad, it, Scott. It's We've sad. never had a sad Patreon shout out. Before, it's it's but... sad and tragic. Right. So I heart mean, right. We wish you well. Yeah. Uh, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll join your GoFundMe, I guess. <laughs> Let's bring that percentage up to 1%. But heart right's giving us money. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, sadly all heart right has. And, uh. Next we have, uh, somebody who upped their pledge. Her name is Victoria Nielsen and she's from Hub- Hubberg in Denmark. Hubberg. I think. <laughs> I don't know for sure. Uh, that Yeah, Denmark is great. Denmark, I'd love. Let's go. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Um, next up, we have from Moncton, New Brunswick, Angela Goodwin. Thank you, Angela. Thanks, Angela. Amazing. Amazing indeed. Amazing indeed. And next, we have somebody who upped their pledge, mm-hmm. Sean Dissington. And he's from Stoke-on-Trent, in Great Britain. Was that a real place? Stoke-on-Trent. Yes, it certainly is. It sounds I, like, I'm probably it sounds doing like, the wrong accent for the area, but... It sounds like three places. Yeah. Wow. Next we have, from Kamloops, British Columbia, whoa, whoa. Blair Martin. Blair Martin. Thank you, Blair. Thank you so much, Blair. Christine Maudsley from... Edmonton, Alberta, upped her pledge. No, thank you, Christine. Thank you very much. Now, interestingly, this next person, we know. We do. Her name is Hayes Selby D. Wow, yes. Yeah, but she she doesn't give us any information where she's from, even though we know. But uh, well, let's 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 see. Is she actually from that place? And what does she do there? Yeah, no, she's absolutely from that place. I know her well. I know her well. Been chatting What's with she... her for for a long time, and and just a swell person. Where's uh, she from? Oh, uh, San Jose. Oh, but in the... in where? Costa Rica. Exactly. Wow, look at me. Let's see, you do know. You do know, right? I guess I'm impressed. And I think she's a lizard wrangler there, if I remember correctly. Uh, that's her previous job. Oh, she was, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. she did about she's 20 years. On. She did about 20 years of lizard wrangling. She was really good at it. You just get to a point where you're like, you know, I can't just do lizards all day, every day. Yeah. Yeah. So now she's an ostrich wrangler. Oh, I Okay. Yeah. Sadly, wow. we don't have any ostriches there. Right. So she's unemployed. She's unemployed. Well, she's she's really what it is is she's in training for ostrich wrangling, and then she might move to uh, I don't know where they have wherever they have ostriches. Australia, I don't know. Sure, there you go. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but so uh, yeah, you know. So thanks, Hayes. You're 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 good people, and uh, you you know I'm glad you hung up your lizard wrangling uh, hat because that's a, it's a tough gig. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Next, we have uh, Duffy Bear or Daphne Kwong from Brisbane, Australia. Oh, beautiful. She, I'll bet you she's a nice lady. 
She better be. She better be. She sounds like a nice lady if she's supporting us. That's right. Uh, next, we have Lawton Melmoth. And oh. Lawton has upped uh, the pledge. And Lawton is from Twickenham, England. Twickenham. Twickenham. Wow. Are you sure that's really where they're from, or are they tricking them? <laughs> oh, hey, oh, boy, oh, boy. Woo. Oh, no. Because uh, it's called tricking them. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> and from a uh, mon... Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Uh-huh. It's a French name. Oh, no. Saint Angle, Saint Angele de Monoir, Quebec. Uh, I don't think that's real. And that is Chloe Polidoro. Well, thank Chloe you, Chloe Polidoro. Oh, yes. that's a great. Thank name. you. I just slaughtered your your place name, but uh, you know what? If I, you if probably you, don't really care. If you did, that's now should how how it should be pronounced. Uh, right. Yeah. Pronounce it the way Mike does because yeah. uh, that makes it easier for Mike. <laughs> Which ultimately <laughs> is very important. What? Yeah, that's not a big, you know, it's not, you're not wrong. <laughs> Next, we have Shelly McCaskill, and she's from Somerville, Massachusetts, and she upped her pledge. Well, thank, thank you, you so Shelley. much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, much appreciated. Mm-hmm. And then we have Stu. Stu. S-T-U. Stu. Yeah, good old Stu. Yeah, where's Stu from? Covedo in Ecuador. Ecuador sounds like a, a nice place because. Isn't that like right on the equator? That's why it's called Ecuador. It, and and Covedo is is close to the coast. It's close to the coast. Oh. I've been there many times. Many Have you? T- yeah, yeah, yeah. And what like, does Stu do in Ecuador? Oh well, ironically, Stu is the premier, the leading, the highest. Uh, Ranking maker of stew. Oh, stew, stew makes stew. Yeah, stew makes stew. Uh, you know, and you would say, you could say, uh, he was really born into it. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, he, he's like four Michelin stars for, uh, do they rank the five Michelin stars? It's the highest star ranking ever. And, yeah. uh, yeah, his, his stew is like, whoo. Oh, tell me about it. You got to try this stew. Stew. It's some. It's stew's amazing stew. Oh, it's stupidly amazing. It sounds stupendous. It's. It really is. It really is. Thank you so much, Stu. I hope you don't leave us after we make fun of your name so many times. <laughs> Next, we have Ashley Herman. I don't know where Ashley's from either. Is she related to Pee Wee? Pee Wee Herman, maybe. <laughs> uh, sadly, no. She wishes she oh. was. That's too she bad. really, yeah, it, it is. It, it's sad. It's tragic. It's unfortunate. Uh, but she's from Brazil. Oh. Yeah. I love a good Brazil. There's, you know, like, uh, uh, you go hang out with, uh, uh, you know, Anderson Silva. So do you get a Brazilian every few months? Cause you like Brazil so much? Do I? Oh, I get him daily. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. want to know. I really don't. But it's just one one strand of hair a day, the, oh the Brazilian off. So that's yeah. why I got to go every day because I'm, sens- I'm sensitive. And what does Ashley do in Brazil? But where in Brazil is she exactly? Though? Well, uh, you know, Brazil's got a lot of hard to pronounce names. Yeah, uh, but she's from Try kilometer one. kilometer ninety two. She's from Kilometer 92? Yeah. Okay, f- yeah. Yeah. fair enough. I guess yeah. that's a place there. And what does yeah. she do in Kilometer 92? She talks trash about Kilometer 91. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, I mean, just numerically, they're one below, so, you know, they, they're not as good. There you go. Yeah. Next we have Kathy Aliff, and she's from Louisville, Kentucky. Good. Hey, well, thanks, Kathy. Right? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you much, Lee. Uh, Melissa Olstrom. Unsure where she's from. Oh, uh, Samu. You okay. Know Sam, you know Samu, right? No. In You know, in Libya? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. It's, I'm it's, very it's, familiar with Libya. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I like I like Libya beans. Oh no, that's Libby's beans. Sorry. Uh, on Lima. Yeah. You just mm. yeah, zero zero for two there, Mike. Yeah. Oh, I'm a terrible person. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, no. So what does Melissa do in Libya? Oh, uh, she, so it's a really difficult job. It's really, yeah. it, it's hard on the back. Oh, it's hard, it's hard on the back, but somebody has to do it. Right. Yeah. She's a, uh, a, uh, oh, I don't even know how they, how they title it. Like a rock mover. Oh, yeah, uh, her job is to take heavy rocks and move them from one side of the road to the other. Oh, weird. Yeah, yeah. It's a well, rock balance. You've got to have equal parts rock, uh, equal numbers of rocks on each side of the street. They take it very serious there. Rock balance, it really it, it helps center your chi. It helps center your chi. And so they, they have to have... So she has to first count the rocks, uh, assess weight, uh, of each rock and then make sure it's proportionate to the other side of the road. But you oh. can imagine, you can imagine with all that rock movement, like the toll that takes on your back, eh? I can imagine. But great benefits. There's great benefits to the job. And so uh, lots of, uh, lots of acupuncture, uh, lots of back, uh, well, I don't know what the back doctors are called, the backyotomists. Uh, they, yeah, they, yeah, she got, yeah, they lots of, lots of, lots of back care. So thankfully, otherwise it just wouldn't be worth it. A backyotomist. Yeah. Uh, next we have uh, Kathleen Madsen, also known as Peace Cat from Gravenhurst, Ontario. Peace Cat. That's nice. There you go. Um, and then we have Kristen Johnson from. Kristen Johnson. Oro Valley, Arizona. Well, a little Arizona representant. Yep. And, oh, here we have someone from Alberta, April Steele. Thank you, April. Wow, that's like, I think I saw her band a couple of times. It sounds like a lady wrestler. April Steele. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does. Or a, a, an 80s hair band. Right. Yeah. <laughs> They April they're touring with the steel. They're touring with steel. steel Panther, yeah, or oh, Motley Crue, double the steel, right? Wow. That's actually <laughs> what they called the tour. Exactly. Our friend Joshua Brown upped his pledge. Thank you, Joshua, and he's yeah. from Crofton, British Columbia. Oh well, hello, hello, Don Pillen from Sudbury, Ontario. Thank you, Don Pillen. Uh, here we have another PM from Jacksonville, Florida, Valencia Tupper. Wow, Valencia from Jackson. We got uh, another American PM. Wow. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. We have another person from Great Britain. Oh. And this is Terry Williamson. Pip, Thank pip. you. Thank you pip, very pip. much. Pip, pip. Carrie Ann Villeneuve is from St. Hyacinth, Quebec. Well, that's very, hey. Carrying I wonder if she's fun. related to Jacques Villeneuve, the car racer. It has to be. Or Gilles. Could be. Yeah. Has to be. Next, we have Sabrina Ellison. I don't know where Sabrina's from, oh, but uh, yeah. I know she has like a, a show about witches, right? Am yes. I wrong? On yeah. Netflix? No, you're right, Sabrina. Yeah. yeah Is she, that the I, same Sabrina? Uh, no, it's not. No, it's, oh, it's sadly. Okay. I, yeah, I would way off base you, then. You were. It would have been great, but uh, mm -hmm. Sabrina, this Sabrina is from uh, Lusaka in Zambia. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, it's a great what, place. What does she do there? She runs uh, a Netflix show about witches. <laughs> she dreams about that. That is her end goal. Mm. But sadly, but sadly, no, no, that's not not what she does. Well, what does she do then, Scott? <laughs> oh, I did, oh, you want that? Okay. Uh, she works at Zambia's equivalent of Seven Eleven. She owns a chain of them. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, they're called Twelve One. Twelve One. Yeah. I don't yeah. even understand that. Well, neither do I. But that's probably why we don't live in Zambia. Oh. Yeah. Maybe, Fair I guess enough. To them, it makes sense. But uh, yeah, so uh, she runs a chain of them. Uh, it's a thriving industry, a thriving yep. business there. 
Wow. Uh, they don't sell Slurpees there. They sell okay. Sluppies. They call them Sluppies. Sluppy. Sluppies, yes, but uh, yeah. equally as delicious. And really, really, in Z- Zambia can get quite hot, so they're, you know, people, they just fly off the shelf. There you go. Yeah. That sounds like fun. It's it's a good gig. It's a good gig. Next we have... Uh, I forgot where we were. We just... It was Sabrina, right? We just did? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sa- Sally Norris, and she is from Weymouth in Great Britain. Ah. Oh, another, another... Another Brit. And then we have uh, Kelly Kichi... Oh. Who came in at the PM level, but didn't leave us any information about where she lives or any of that kind of stuff. So that's interesting. Oh, so it's a rogue PM. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I happen to know. I do right here happen to know. Mm-hmm. She's from Madagascar. Oh. Yeah, right? Like the movie? It is exactly like the movie. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And specifically, the town is called, uh, she's uh, Mahabo. Oh, wow. Yeah. You really, yeah. Yeah, Mahabo. Is there it, like massive tortoises there and weird animals? and? Yeah, and they all talk. Oh, amazing. Yeah, well, but that's so, her job. That's her job. She, she's a translator. She, uh, yes and no. She's a oh, translator. She just talks to the animals. Well, I know it's translator slash teacher. So she has to teach a lot of the animals how to talk, but then can translate when needed. I think we're going to have somebody come to your house and, and, and take you someplace. <laughs> 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 just for a little while. I, you know, I, I've got bags packed. <laughs> I'm ready. Go. I'm ready. Well, that sounds like fun. So Good thank one. you very much, Kelly. Yeah, thanks, much Kelly. Much appreciated. And next we have Kelsey Lewis from Mesa, Arizona. Oh. Mesa. Mesa. Isn't there aliens in Mesa? Something something about that. I don't uh, remember. There should be. Right. If there are. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, and Aaron Pen... Aaron Peniuk. And I don't know where Aaron's from. Oh, no, you don't? Uh, nope. Jakarta. In oh, specific, Jakarta. Specifically, South Jakarta. Okay. Yeah. And what does she do there? Uh, she builds fishing boats. Builds fishing boats. Yeah, builds fishing boats. Quite luxurious ones. It'd be hard to tell. You know, it's a little game they like to call a uh, fishing boat or yacht. <laughs> you oh, got to figure you go. out. Yeah, that's how luxurious they are. They don't actually do a lot of fishing on them, though. though. More, more, more yachting. <laughs> Next, we have Michaela, J- Michaela Jose Binks. Wow. And she is from London. London. And as in the actual, as in the London in the UK. Yeah. How's that? Wow. How, how, uh, straightforward. Just London. Exactly. We, know, we get it. Well, we it know. could be London, Ontario, but no, it's, it's London, the big London. Yeah. When you just say it, London, because when you're from London, Ontario, you say, I'm from London, Ontario. When it's just yeah, no London. Sh- no shade to London, Ontario. No, no, not London. at all. But that yeah. y- you've got to you got to follow it up with Ontario. So if you just drop London, yeah, we get it. We know. Exactly. Yeah, we get it. And lastly for Patreon, we have Alish Harris from Salt Ooh. Lake City, ah. Utah. Wow. Salt Lake Salt- City, Utah. Yeah, I want to go to Utah. It looks like a, an interesting place to drive around. Do you think so? Oh yeah, I love I love the desert stuff. When yeah, I went well, to Nevada, uh, we were we were in Arizona as well, but uh, I didn't get to Utah. I want to see Utah. Yeah, they got lots of desert there. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. I am very curious. So on to our uh, oh gosh, on to our. Uh, Onto our, onto PayPal for donut money donations. Look at oh, this. Holy okay. smokes. Wow. We have Ashley White and she says, hi, Mike and Scott. I'm Ashley White from Nampa, Idaho. Very close to May- Mike's favorite, Boise, Idaho or Boise, 
Idaho. I love the show. Scott's giggle is infectious, and I love that you really care about mental health awareness. Have some tasty treats on me. P.S. Mike, I miss when you used to say pee pal. Well, thank you for the pee pal donation, Ashley White. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you so much. Here's one from Jennifer Obst. She says, Hi, Mike and Scott. Dark Poutine is the first podcast that I really started listening to. I really enjoyed it. I usually listen when I am working on my ceramics. Oh. Another ceramics person. Oh. And when I started listening, I told myself when I graduate my BFA, I can sign up for the Patreon. Then this pandemic thing happened and my summer job is highly unlikely to happen. So for now, I'm sending you guys some donut money. Classic honey dip for the win. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's really I just kind found of out you. my convocation will be happening online. I just found out my convocation will be happening online and that is causing me a wee bit of sad emotion spillover. That's too bad. Mm. I know many of my fellow 2020 graduates are in similar boat and I was wondering if you could please make a shout out to all the 2020 graduates in lieu of my donut money shout out. Well, too late, but we will say, hey, you know what? All you 2020 graduates who are not able to put on your cap and gown and walk up on a stage and take your uh, sheepskin or whatever it is that you're, you're getting this year. You all worked just as hard for it as anybody else has ever worked for it. And uh, you all deserve a big round of applause. So hooray from us. Congratulations to you guys and well-deserved. You congratulations to all the graduates this year. We uh, hope for you the all the best, and that this nonsense is over soon, and you guys can get to work and put your skills to good use. Absolutely, I concur. Here's some a donut money from Irene Briand, who says to share with your families to spread a little happiness in tough times. Heart and hugs. Oh, thank you. Hugs right back. Here's from here's one from Jerry Katz. She says, "My credit card expired and I missed a few months of Patreon. Please accept some donut money to make up for that. Thanks, Mike and Scott, for being familiar and comforting voices in my ears as we all through live through this scary time." Jerry from Minnesota, USA. Thanks, Jerry. Oh, Jerry, thank you so much. Uh, Sally Norris says, uh, with her donation, says. Thank you. Thank you both so much for keeping us all sane. A, eh? Sally N. <laughs> well, I don't know about sane. Yeah, well, yeah. We're not. Uh, <laughs> Mike, Sh Mike Schroeder sent in a three-digit donation. Whoa. He says, I just started listening to the podcast. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Any relation to Ricky? I don't know. I hope so. And our friend, Denise Sakaki... From Duval, mm. Washington, yeah, sent in a large donation Whoa. as well. well. So thank, thank you. you so much, Denise. You rock, and you she might does. even roll. She does both, and, and what a yeah. what a funny, kind, loving person she is. Yeah, we love Denise. She is great, and yeah. uh, you're you're helping us out because uh, <laughs> people have no idea what's going on behind the scenes here, and uh, yeah. sometimes it's tough. Yeah, so, no kidding. Uh, we're, we're just, we're going to keep rolling regardless. Yeah. I might have to be doing it from a, a little tiny, uh, uh, I don't know. From your car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was quite a load of patrons and Ooh. donut money pledges this week. So thank you so much yeah. to our, our patrons past and present for your pledges. That's a lot of P's and the alliteration. Past, and present. And again, I'll say. P. <laughs> We do appreciate your support of the show, and it's really meaningful right now. Yeah. If you want to help support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine, or for one-time support, you can send us some donut money at PayPal, or as mentioned earlier, PayPal, at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already, it would mean a lot to us. If you subscribe to the show, you can easily find us on Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. You can easily rate us on podchaser.com. Check out our website, darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Give us a like or follow on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. 
Most importantly, thank you for listening. Tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Just love each other, eh? And uh, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.